Well, it is good to be with you this morning. I'm glad that you're here. Um, it is summer in the UP, and uh, we have not tasted the sun, and it feels like a few moons here um, just because of all of the rain. It's like um, all of the snow we were supposed to get is coming in the form of rain in the summer, and I, it's not been as pleasant as it usually is here. So I'm glad that you're here on a sunny day to open the Word of God together and to see what He has to say to us as a community, and it's always good um, when we lift the name of Jesus. But if you would, would you just pray with me before we begin? Father, we come, and we are thankful. We're thankful for Uh, your son Jesus who came for us, that you didn't just leave us here in our own uh, mire, but you came and you came to rescue us uh, through his work and we're thankful. And God, as we open your word today, we ask that your spirit would move in us, it would change us, it would would guide us into the likeness of, of who you are, that we would be imitators of you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been talking about uh, this idea of what does it mean to have a family and friends and what does it mean to have relationships. And we, we've been in this series um, for a few weeks and really focused on family and, and focused on what does it look like for us to, to live in, in, in family relationships and how does it all work. And, and so one of the things that we said is that the scriptures tell us that we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And the second of these is to love your neighbor. Last week, we talked about this idea in Ephesians that says that we are to, to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And we really talked about what does that look like in families? What does it look like for, for husbands and wives to, to mutually be submitting and out of reverence for Christ? And then we talked about kids and what does that look like for them to, to honor their father and mother, to listen to their instruction. And you see how this, this vertical relationship with God, this loving the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, is moving then into these other other relationships. And, and so today we're going to, to look at the text and it's going to move us in, into relationships that are outside of, of our family circle. It's going to move us into this other, these other relationships. All of us have a natural capacity to, be, to love those who love us. Right, we just—it's just natural to us. If if you like me, I like you. Type of a thing. It just kind of how it works, and I, I'm good to you because you're good to me. And, and we go, yeah, that 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 seems to make sense. It's very easy for us to do that, and, and yet God has called us into something else. He's called us into. Um, outside of this natural capacity to love into a different way where the vertical is always pushing into the horizontal all the way to our neighbors. And we're gonna talk just a little bit of what that actually means today. And yet Jesus tells us this. He tells us about our natural capacity and then he tells us that we need to take a step further. And so he says, if you love those who love you, what credit is it to you? <laughs> Even sinners, those who don't know God, those who do not have a restored relationship on the vertical scent, love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even the sinners do that. Even those who don't have that vertical relationship. In the Ephesians passage, it moves from this primary relationship to God that we all need, that we need to have a relationship with God through what Jesus has done for us. So we have a vertical relationship that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. And then it moves into family relationships and it continues to move out from there. And so this, it takes this big leap from children to really employer-employee relationship. And so we're just going to read this in Ephesians chapter 6. It'll be on the screen to my right and to my left. And it says this, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from 
your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is a slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and your master is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. And so, just an important note here, uh, when it talks about slave uh, or slavery here, it is not the America slavery or the world slavery in the 18th, 19th century. Um, it's very different than that under Roman, the Roman Empire. Um, the slavery found in America where a person was stolen and forced into labor um, is condemned in the scriptures. Uh, Deuteronomy 24-7, you can write that down in your notes. It's very clear there um, in, in that, that that is not this. And so Paul is not uh, saying, hey, this is what you're supposed to do if you're in that situation. But this is more akin, it's not exactly, but it's more akin to employee, employer, type of a relationship in the text. And, and so we have our families, our husbands and wives and our children, and you see them on a daily basis or maybe not on a daily basis, but there's always this connection point where it's very easy maybe to love them or care about them or submit to them, but this goes out and it jumps to the employer or employee relationship. And so what it says here is that we are to serve, we are to work, we are to serve um, like we're serving Jesus. It says that both in, in 5 and verse 7. And it says, um, basically, we're to obey our, our earthly masters, our, our employers, with fear and trembling. We're to obey those who have charge over us on this earth. And, and so if you think about that in, 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 in this text, the implications of that are huge, right? There's always this authority um, that we're coming under. There's always these places where there's authority, and, and, and it's not just in the employer-employee relationship, but it's larger than that. And when we are under under that authority, we are serving like we are serving uh, Jesus. Anyone who has rule or authority over us, we obey them. Um, that is part of the character. That's part of the submitting. But we're not just submitting to them. We're submitting to Christ, obedience to Christ. We do this with a sincere heart. We're not just doing it when the masters are looking, right? It, it, it's, we are we're genuinely, wholeheartedly looking because who's the ultimate master? Jesus is the ultimate master. And, and Jesus is the ultimate master in the midst of this. And so we're, we're not just being watched by our earthly um, employer, and we only, we're not just seeking his favor in the midst of this. But on the flip side of that, Jesus is watching us in how we're doing this and we're serving him. And so work is something that um, we uh, can't justify doing a half-hearted service. And in this text, it never says, well, well, your boss, my boss is really bad, and so you can work half-heartedly, or the company actually owes me more money than they're actually paying me, so you can steal their staplers. It doesn't say that. Um, it, it says that we're serving Jesus as we work and as we do this. And, and so there isn't a justification, there is not a clause in that. And so we serve with integrity, um, and because the Lord is watching us, and, and he is really the one we are serving in the midst of this, we serve, and here's the deal. We serve for a heavenly reward. This is verse 8. Um, verse 8 gives us another reason why we work with our whole heart and obey those who are in authority over us is because we're rewarded by God. This helps us, I think, when we feel overwhelmed, we feel like it's not fair, we feel like there, there's an unjustness that is going on in the midst of our workplace, we, there is this, this peace where we go, I'm serving the Lord in this, and man, this is a, a really great thing that I get to do for him in the midst of that. It doesn't matter what you're doing as you're serving, but you, there's in those feelings of injustice, the sense of fairness that often leads us in directions that are our half-hearted work, um, stealing time for work. It, it says you're not working for that because you're going to get paid. You're, the, 
but you're going to get paid in heaven. There's a reward for you in heaven because Jesus is keeping account of the good that you're doing in, in the workplace. And, and um, then it says, well, how are you to be in charge? So there are, there are those who are under and those who are, those who are over. And everybody has that relationship at some point or some place within in their lives. Um, even a CEO of a company has a board that they're answering to. There's always these connections where there is this, the, how the world works. And it says, well, how do, you, how do you operate as one who is in authority? Paul instructs how to deal with those who are under us in this. And he, he says um, there are certain tasks or certain ways that you do this. And he says that masters um, realize that you're true, who your true master is. He says, hey, you realize, um, don't treat your, your slaves in the, in the same way. Do not threaten them since you do not know that he who is both their master and yours in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. There's this incredible equality in this, in this statement. Like, he's talking through this, but there's this incredible equality in the sense that you understand that these are people that are created in the image of God, and so you are to treat them in, in such a way. You're not to threaten them, and you're not to push. And in, in Roman... Uh, culture or Roman slavery, there were like a lot of the, the, the threatening stuff, which you wouldn't have here in America, or maybe you do have here in America, but there's ways to remedy that. You can sue your employer. You can do, you know, do things. You can come against your employer if they wrongly terminate you or all of those types of things, because we have laws that kind of protect in this. They did not have that. And so there would be a difference in the midst of this, but it's calling these ones who are in authority. It says, hey, you don't, you don't use that authority to threaten to get the job done, but you come alongside and you instruct in the midst of this because you understand who their heavenly father is and it's the same that is yours is theirs and there's no favoritism. And so it doesn't matter um, whether it's a man or a woman. It doesn't matter if, if it's a, somebody who is a slave or somebody who is free. We are all equal under that, that we are created in the image of God. And so in the image bearing of who God is, um, you work and you, you don't bully others to do the job, but you, you work in such a way that you are, are understanding your position in the midst of that. And, and there's this motivation, again, this motivation is who you're serving, who you're serving. And so the submission, you see the submission in there. Employees are working unto, to, the, to the Lord. Employers are working unto the Lord. And, and so how would that change things? It would radically change things. It would radically change things in the Roman government, right? Or in the Roman system. Paul says that you are to share the same master with those who are in subjection to you. And this, this has broad implications to it. It has broad implications, not just in, in that employer-employee relationship, but it has implications in all kinds of relationships. All the way up to the largest in, in, of the whole is the government. And in Romans 13, it talks about this. It, it talks about this idea, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God, consequently, Whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear of, of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you um, will be commended. For the one authority... For the one in authority is God's servant for good. And we're going to stop right there. So when it comes to the government, um, they are placed there by God. Remember what Jesus says. He's talking to Pontius Pilate, right? And, and he says, um, I don't really have to answer to you. This is a Levi paraphrase. I don't really have to answer to you because the only reason you have this authority over me is because... God gave it to you. Like, 
he's, he's recognizing this, like that God put him in authority for that moment, for that time. And I, I, he's recognizing in that in the midst. And so whether you agree with our political climate or you don't agree with our political climate, it does not matter. You submit to the ones who are in authority over you when that is producing good in your life. And so that is a loose term. That's a little bit of a loose term. You may not like gas prices. 10 4. Do you like gas prices? Oh, it's on the uh, it is on the prayer. You do not like the gas prices, right? You might not like the food uh, prices. You might not like some of the policies that are there. That's just how it is, right? And, and yet, I, I'm not going to go into the store and steal it because it's too high, right? We submit to this thing. There's inflation. There's things that happen. That there's a law of the land that you can't walk into the store and just grab your bread and walk back out, right? Like that is, um, there's a submission, and that's a crazy um crazy idea in the midst of this, but it, it plays out. We are not anti-authority. We're in submission to authority. That is part of the Christian way. It's a part of the submitting to. But you're gonna go, and this is, I don't wanna get all these emails on Monday. Well, what about the times where they're not morally going the way of God? I think that's the times where you can go, no. It, it, it is for your good. It's not for your good, always. And there are things because, guess what? All the people that are in authority are broken men and women, sinners just like you, and sometimes they make mistakes that are against God's precepts. And if it goes against God's precepts, you can go no, but that's the only time. It's not, Jesus never led a rebellion against Rome. Do you notice that? Like he had 10,000 angels that he could have called down and wiped them out in a New York minute, right? But he didn't do that. He submitted to the government. He even paid taxes to the government even though they were corrupt. He did that. And so there is this submission because why? It always goes back to that primary. God put them there. God put them there in this moment. And so there is this movement from the vertical to the horizontal. And, and to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Part of doing that is a submitted life a submitted life to, to your wife, to your husband, to your children, to, to your employee and your employer, to the government. There's a submitted life that happens in the midst of that as we love God because we recognize who he is. We recognize that he is actually the one in control. He is the one in the midst of that that is in control. And so we have this vertical relationship with God that goes into the, the, the horizontal. It's one of the things that's interesting to me is people will often say, and this has become kind of a cultural phrase at, at some level, people will say, it's, you know, the Christ, Christian life is really simple. Love God, love others. Love God, love others. It's actually not simple. It's actually super complex in, in the sense of, um, one doesn't happen without the other. If you do not love God, the second will not happen. It, 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 it cannot happen. It, it, you may do some good things, and, and you may care about people, and you probably are caring about people that, that are closest to you and then kind of moves out from there, but it's not going to happen how God wants it to happen in this, this horizontal movement of love. Remember, love... Love is doing what is good for those um, around you. It, it is doing what is in their best interest. So Jesus comes down to earth. He takes on flesh, God in the bod, right? Like he has flesh, and so he has all of the temptation. He has all of the, the, the tiredness that we have. And, and what do you often see him doing? You often see, see him escaping to do what? To make sure that his relationship with the Trinity that has been always 
in existence is right and correct. And he's filled up with this relationship. He begins to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. He teaches us to pray. Who is he praying to? He's praying to God the Father, but he's a part of the Trinity. He is God, and yet he is praying to the role that the Father has in the midst of this. And he is being renewed in the midst of that in the world in which we live. And so you see this, this primary relationship that Jesus is continuing to connect in with, with God. He's continuing to develop that. And that allows him then to do what? It allows him to love his neighbor as himself. It allows him to do that. It, it, it produces that in him. And so Jesus came here and the thing that he did for us, he came with what? He came full of grace and truth. I love the grace part. Don't you? Amen. I love the grace part. I don't always like the truth part, right? But he came with both of them. He came to give us grace. He came to say, hey, you, you are in trouble, folks, and here is why. He still told the truth. Why did he do that? Because it's the very best thing that he could do for us. It was the most loving thing that he could do for us, right? And you see this over and over and over again, all the way to the cross. When he gets to the cross, what does he do? He lays his life down, no greater love. We know this passage, right? There is no greater love than, than, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And what does Jesus do? He lays down his life because it's the very best thing that he could do for us. There is nothing that you can do to earn your salvation. There's nothing that you can do to restore the relationship that you have with God other than to believe in the one that he has sent, and that is Jesus. And Jesus goes as a willing participant to the cross for you and for me. And so when we say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, the starting point for each one of us is always Jesus. It's always Jesus. And then the natural byproduct of that, of loving the Lord your God in that way, is it begins to go out this way. There is no way, let me just tell you a little secret. There is no way without Jesus I'm submitting to my wife. And I will tell you, there's no way she's submitting to me. There is no way my kids are honoring me the way they should without Jesus. There is no way the employer employee relationship works without Jesus, without this vertical, this submission to each other. There's no way that I have the ability to love my neighbor as myself without Jesus. It just doesn't work. So we're gonna go to another familiar story. It's a very familiar story. And uh, I had, I'll just tell you, I had two aha moments this week. You ever have those moments? They're fantastic, right? And like your mind's like, whoa. And I had one where it was like, whoa, but a little embarrassing, whoa. Um, and, and so when I was a kid, we had inner tubes um, that we floated around on rivers. Uh, we used them for hunting. I'd, my dad would send me out into the swamp when we shot geese on a rope and he would pull me back. Sometimes it would flip over. Very cold in October or November here when you're doing this. Um, very, lots of stories about that. But it's an inner tube, right? So my boys blew up the tire on our golf cart and I couldn't fix it myself. And so I brought it into a shop. I took it off, brought it into a shop. I got to the shop, and I handed the guy, and I said, well, I think the tire, the, the outer tire is fine, but I think it's the inner tube. And I went, whoa, inner tube, inner tube. Do you, do you get what I'm saying here? It's not just something you float on to go pick up dead geese. Um, I, and in my mind, I didn't say this out loud, but I was like, whoa, Whoa, it was like, you know, just like one of those moments in your life that you're, you shouldn't probably tell other people, but it happened to me. It was an aha moment. The other one is a little bit better um, that, that I really feel like the Lord gave to me uh, in, in the midst of this. I have read the story and I heard the story since I was three years old of the Good Samaritan. 
I've heard it over and over again. Mrs. Cola mine, and she would sit in at one of those little little uh, desk like this, and we were, were sitting there as little students in Sunday school class, told me the story the first time I heard it about the Good Samaritan. And we know this story, right? We've heard this story. So there's this teacher. There's this teacher of the law. And, and we're not talking a, a lawyer law. We're talking the law of Moses. And so this guy is... He is highly prepped, highly understands this stuff, has memorized by this point, if he is a teacher of the law, he's probably memorized the whole Old Testament. Whoa, right? Like that's a lot of memorization. Plus another book that is about the same size or larger than that of of kind of the interpretations of this. This guy has like this this big, you know, knowledge of this. He is is a lawyer in this, right? He, he, He understands the law. And so... <clears throat> he's an expert in this. And he stood up to, uh, to test Jesus. So this, we know right off the bat that this wasn't a pure, um, a pure question. It was, it was one to try to trip Jesus up. And, and so he says, teacher, as a sign of respect, maybe a little bit sarcastic, he asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus, knowing his background, says, well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? So he's going back to his backdrop of understanding the whole Old Testament and plus the interpretation, right? And how do you read it? And so the man answers. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. This is familiar to us, right? He answers it correctly. And Jesus tells him now, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. What is Jesus saying there? Do this perfectly and you will live. Do this perfectly and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? We do this whole justification thing all the time, right? If we lose a game, we go, you cheated, right? Like a board game. If I'm playing a board game with you, I think you cheated, because I can't imagine how I lost that game. Or, or the refs are bad. We justify our behaviors all the time. And so this guy is looking for, I think he understands the law. He's thinking, hey, I've done pretty well in, in loving the Lord my God as my, with all my heart, all my soul. Like I give, like I take my spices and I measure 10 percent out and I give that to the temple because I'm tithing correctly. I'm doing, I'm not working on the Sabbath. I've done really good at this, right? So I love God. And he's also Jewish. So he's born into the family of God. And, and, And so, but he wants to justify this and he wants to know, well, who is his neighbor? How's he doing on loving his neighbor? He probably loves his mama and daddy. He probably loves his kid. It doesn't say this in the text, but I think this is probably true. He loves his kids and, and, and he loves some of the neighbors that are down there. He maybe helped the guy with a fence down right next to him. I don't know exactly what happened, but he's thinking in his head, like, how do I just, who is my neighbor? Like, is it the whole world? Right, that's, that's what he's thinking. And, and Jesus said, Well, and Jesus, remember, he's like this masterful teacher. He's an incredible teacher. And so he's gonna kind of answer it with a story. But the story at face value, we all go, oh, yeah, we gotta care for people. And so it's a story that you probably are familiar with. You're probably familiar with. And he, he, he starts to tell this story about this guy who's traveling to Jerusalem Um, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he's attacked. And these robbers come, they beat him up, they strip him naked, they take all the good stuff, and they leave him there for dead. And then there's these guys that come by. One is a religious dude, and, and he's a priest. And, you know, he's just come from sacrificing things in the temple, and he's walking by, and he sees this guy over there, and he goes, nah, not for me. I'm not gonna do that. That guy's gonna make me unclean. I'm not gonna do that. And then a Levite comes, And same thing, like, nope, not gonna do it. Like, I see the guy, but I'm not gonna do it. And then you have what we get or what we hear as the good Samaritan. And this guy's traveling through, um, and just so you know, Samaritans don't like Jewish people. This is a Jewish person. And he sees the guy in need and he goes, man, I gotta help him right now. 
And, and so he helps him out, right? He picks him up, he cares for him, he takes him to a place where he can get some respite and heal up and he pays for it all, it puts him on his donkey and he walks there and, and it's this great story and you go, yeah, that's how we're supposed to live. And yeah, you're right, we are supposed to live like that. But this story, remember, Jesus is a masterful teacher. He's a masterful teacher. And then Jesus goes on. Let's go to the end of this verse. And he says, go and, do, go and do likewise, right? Here's the problem in this. What was the question that the man asked? And here is my aha moment. What must I do to inherit eternal life? How do you inherit something? Do you do anything to inherit something? Do you earn an inheritance? You don't earn inheritance. It is given to you. Mama and daddy own a business. Um, someday Bubba and Sally Sue will have to give their farm over to their kids, right? And, and so it's split up in the will just perfectly so nobody is fighting. They, they've done their due diligence in this. And, and, and so they're going, and the kids will, when they pass away, they're going to inherit the family farm. Did the kids do anything? No, they didn't do anything other than they were more, right? They didn't do anything to, to get the inheritance. This guy asked a question of how do, I, how do I inherit this? How do I earn my inheritance? It's a very interesting question. It's actually a very bizarre question because we know that you don't inherit that way. You don't earn an inheritance, you just get an inheritance, and Jesus kind of answers the question. He pushes the man to answer the question. And, and so Jesus asks him, well, what does it say in the law? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And the second of these is to the, love your neighbors yourself. And then he tells this story, right? Like, who's my neighbor? Well, he tells this story. And he tells this story, and we uh, really quickly in cursory read of this go, oh, I'm supposed to be nice to people, and if I see somebody in need, I'm supposed to help them. And then I'll inherit the kingdom of God. That's not right. That's not what he's answering in the midst of this. What he's answering or what he's showing this guy is that he can't do this. Now just track with me for a second. All of our sin, all of our sin, my sin, your sin, everyone's sin, comes out of me not loving the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind. And this starts very early and loving my neighbor perfectly as myself. Let me tell you, we, we do this early on. We call it the terrible twos. I think it really happens at three, though. I don't know why we call it the terrible twos, but I really actually think it's terrible threes. That was my experience. Maybe your experience is a little bit differently. But what do they learn? They learn this word that has two letters to it. No. No. And, and are they in that moment, are they in that moment loving their neighbor as their, themselves perfectly? The answer is no, right? Just no, they're not. Because why? They don't love the Lord their God with all their heart, all their soul, and all their mind. And the only way to love your neighbor as yourself is, is the vertical. And then it goes to the horizontal. You can't do this one without this one. It's not like God goes, oh, Levi P. Madison, oh, he's a good guy. No, God goes, you didn't love me with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and it caused issues. You're a sinner in need of a savior, and that savior is Jesus, who lived it absolutely perfectly, and he is the one who justifies you. He is the one who justifies you. Loving the Lord your God, having a proper relationship with God is the thing that we need in order to do this, but it doesn't earn us our salvation. Who earns us our salvation? It's only through the work of Jesus. He came with grace and he came with truth. He came with the truth that says, you are in me, we're sinners, we're not good guys. It was not like, oh yeah, Levi's good, we're gonna let him into heaven, of course. Like, that's what I think sometimes, but that's not true, it's not true. It's only because of Jesus. It's only because he loved the Lord, his God. He was part of the Trinity, but he loved 
with all of his heart, all of his mind, and he lived this out perfectly. And I will tell you, if you're sitting here today and going, oh, it's just about a white lie. No, it's not just about a little white lie and you are actually a good person. No, it is about your relationships with others too. And the byproduct of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind is a submitted life to each other. And it's loving them in such a way, in such a way that we're submitted to them in, in, in that we're gonna love them as ourselves. And I will tell you, I cannot do it without Jesus. I cannot do it without Jesus. And I will tell you, you can't either. You can't do it either. It's not going to happen. And so what, this, what Jesus is doing in the midst of this for this guy, and you can read this in chapter nine, he's telling them, you need me. Here's your inheritance. I'm the one who justifies you. You can try to justify yourself all you want, that you're good enough, that you're good enough in the midst of this. But you can try all you want, but it's not going to happen without a restored relationship with God. That's the gospel. That's the story that Jesus is, is speaking. The inheritance that you get is the inheritance that was given to Jesus. And we become, we became co-heirs to this. We become, we become people who are connected to what Jesus did for us, and we become, that's how we get our inheritance. That's why we are sons and daughters of the Most High. That's why we are friends of Jesus. It isn't because of something you've done. It's because of what he's done for us. He lived this perfectly. And when you begin in that relationship, when you begin in a forgiven relationship with Jesus, what happens is you begin to restore this relationship, and the natural byproduct is this. And if you get this confused, that we're just to run around and to love people, you should but it will never earn you eternal life. That is not your inheritance, being a nice guy or a nice lady. It's not your inheritance. It's only through the work of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we come. Oh, we come and we are, we are people who do not want to submit at times um, to each other out of reverence for you and I just ask that that would be our heart's cry. That would be our heart's cry, that we would, we would submit to one another out of reverence, whether it be an employer or an employee, that we would treat them how you would want us to treat them, whether it be our kids or whether it be a husband-wife relationship, that this would be connected to, to our primary relationship with you. God, we're thankful for Jesus, who came as the perfect lamb, who loved he loved you, God, with all of his heart, all of his mind, all of his soul. He was connected to you in his very nature. He was you, and he is a part of the Trinity, three in one, and we're thankful that he came for us, that God, that you sent your son for us, that you loved us that much, that you would sacrifice him for us. And he loved us perfectly. He loved us as, a, as he should. He loved us. He loved in such a way that he laid down his life for us. And we're thankful for that today. God, help us to go and be imitators of you, to love like you love because we have a restored relationship with you because of him. It's in his name we pray.